The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. There is no substitute for public provision in a country of the size and immensity of India and, and her uh, large population. In the medium term, maybe not in the short term, quality health care has to be publicly provided, as is provided in many developed countries. It has to be done. I think healthcare is on the policy agenda. I agree that there is increasing recognition in India that in the coming years, there's increasing political appetite to spend more on healthcare. And I think for the first time, um, health policy is central to all political campaigns and on the first page of most election manifestos. In this episode, India's long and winding road to affordable and accessible health care. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. With a population now exceeding 1.4 billion people, India has anything but an easy task delivering adequate health care to all its citizens. India can point to its world-class hospitals and clinics with highly skilled medical staff, yet conspicuous alongside them are the significant gaps in health care access and quality, particularly in rural areas. Health outcomes also vary widely from state to state. Meanwhile, public health care in India is often criticised as archaic, inefficient and even ineffective. And while there's been a massive expansion of private sector providers since the 1990s, in part to fill in the gaps, this trend has left millions unable to afford health care, and millions more financially ruined by medical bills. So how do India's national and state governments try to make quality health care affordable for the masses? How do they juggle the mix of private and public providers to ensure access across all strata of society? And what ultimately stands in the way of an effective and efficient healthcare system for all Indians? Joining me on Ear to Asia to examine the complexities of delivering health care in India is healthcare policy expert Associate Professor Azad Bali from the University of Melbourne and the Australian National University and economist Emeritus Professor Raghbendra Jha from the Australian National University. Welcome to Ear to Asia, Raghbendra, and uh, welcome back, Bali. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Good to be here. Well, if we can start with a really big picture overview, how would you describe, Bali, the state of the healthcare system in India today? Thanks, Sally. I think India has a reasonably well-functioning health system for a populous and large uh, low-middle income country. It's a health system that has many contradictions and it's also shaped by many contradictions. At one end, it offers world-class health services, quick and immediate access to some of the most sophisticated diagnostics and treatment, quality care, a lot of medical innovation. But equally, in some parts of India, healthcare is very challenging to access. It's prohibitively expensive and many sections of society struggle to meet healthcare costs. It's also a very fragmented healthcare system with stark divides along public and private hospitals, urban and rural sectors, and even across states and even within states. So in terms of broad descriptors, most healthcare is sort of privately organized and paid for without insurance. The public system is crowded, under-resourced, and mostly confined to large metropolises and generally speaking, is less preferred to their private counterparts. So that's a broad picture. And there have been some reforms over the past 10 years or so to address some of these gaps in the public system. And we'll get to those reforms in a minute. But Raghbendra, do you agree with that characterization? And do you think a system of contradictions and fragmentation is, is the right way to describe the Indian health system? Well, broadly, I agree with Bali. However, I would like to add a few things. We must remember that when India became independent in 1947, uh, the state of health in India was abysmal. That's the only way to describe it. I'll just give you just one statistic. 
the average lifespan uh, was only 35 years uh, in 1947, and now it is close to 70 and inching beyond 70 in many states. So we have traveled a long way since then. So yes, the current state may look a bit messy, but we should not forget the tremendous progress that has been made. And India has a very uh, strong tradition of uh, preventive health care as opposed to curative health care. All of us know that India is the home of yoga and it is the home of Ayurveda, which is a very well-designed, uh, traditional, herbal-based medicine system. And that has served the country well for several years. So if you see uh, some shortfalls in the statistics, for example, waiting times for an operation or surgery or, or some such thing, then it doesn't necessarily mean that they are going without health care. They may be getting health care, but from a different source. And they may, may have uh, had a good chunk of preventive health care before they got to that condition. So there are some uh, subtleties to that argument, uh, which I would like to advance here. Rugbenja, thank you, because I think it is important to note that, particularly that, yes, it's off a low base, but also take a more holistic approach. Uh, and we are focusing in this podcast, I guess, very much on a, the more formal side of the, of the healthcare system. And Bali, you, you talked about reforms, and I guess the main one there has been the rollout of the National Public Health Insurance Scheme in 2019, which has been a really significant shift. Can you give us a, a picture of how many Indians are covered by this scheme and, and just a little bit about how it works. So the program, the Ayushman Bharat, or now is popularly called PMJ, was announced in 2018 and implemented in 2019. And it aims to offer healthcare coverage to 100 million of India's poorest families. So it covers about 500 million people. Um, so that's about 40% of India's population. And essentially how the program works is that the government has used a 2011 survey to identify the bottom 40% of India's income distribution and enroll them into this program. It's paid for by the central and state governments together, the central government picking up most of the tab. It's largely an insurance-based program. So essentially, if once a person is enrolled in PMJ, they get access to hospital care. So in the event that they fall ill, they just go to any of the hospitals that are part of the program and um, they receive treatment. The treatment is supposed to be cashless, so they don't pay for anything, and the insurance company directly pays hospitals the cost of the treatment. So it's sort of early days right now to see to what extent the program is effective or successful, but it has been an important first step in providing healthcare coverage to a large section of society that was excluded before. And Bali, I want to look a little bit more at how it works in a minute. But first, if I can just ask you, what does it mean then in terms of if we want to look at how uh, different strata of society in India would access health care? So now that you have this public health insurance scheme, at PMJ as it's known, can you give me a sense of how different health care would be the experience of a poor rural family versus maybe a middle income uh, city family? Sure. So I think to get a better sense of that, we need to understand the broad distribution of healthcare coverage in India. I think most healthcare is privately organized and privately financed. So I would say about 70% of health services are provided at private hospitals um, and 30% or so at public hospitals. So everybody has access to public hospitals. Anybody can walk into a public hospital and receive treatment but you may have to end up waiting a long period and the hospitals are understaffed and under-resourced as with most developing countries. So generally people avoid public hospitals and seek care at the private counterparts. So when you walk into a private hospital or seek care at a private center, if you work in the formal economy, that is you work in the private sector or you work for a government department or a government agency, you would have some level of employer's provided health insurance. So you would be covered through that. Bali, that's a very small proportion of people, isn't it? Yep, that's a relatively small proportion. And I would say that's about five or six percent of uh, India's population. And another two or three percent of India's population has sort of voluntary private insurance that they buy themselves. So 
less than 10% of the population has access to formal insurance mechanisms when they, they fall ill. So that's the private sector. And what the PMJ has done is that it offers coverage to those sections of society that weren't covered any any of the private programs or who did not want to access healthcare through the public system. In terms of what it means for large sections of society, so the bottom 40% of India's population now has access to healthcare at private or public hospitals, which they don't have to pay for. But the average middle class person and the average elite still has to pay for healthcare privately. And that's mostly through out-of-pocket payments. And Raghbendra, if we look at that and, and what that has meant in India, I mean, people go into lifelong debt, don't they, just to pay for healthcare if, if they need uh, treatment and particularly you know, significant treatment? Uh, yes, indeed. Many people do go into lifelong debt. They sell off uh, assets, including agricultural land, to finance healthcare expenditures of some people. There are two basic points here. The health insurance is fine. You can you can try to devise various strategies to, to provide health insurance to people. But the first point to reckon with there is, is the healthcare cost structure rational? Are healthcare costs being controlled or is there an escalation of healthcare costs along with the insurance provision? That's one question that has to be put through. And the the government has made some efforts in that direction, but it is not clear that it has been a complete success. The second point to note is that there is no substitute for public provision in a country of the size and immensity of India and and her uh, large population. Uh, In the medium term, maybe not in the short term, public provision, quality health care has to be publicly provided, as is provided in many developed countries. The first obvious constraint to that is, of course, the lack of funds. Healthcare is a state subject in India, so which means each state spends its own funds, and that accounts for the wide uh, variation in state-level spending and state-level provision of health. So uh, there has been a move in the 15th Finance Commission, which controls the sharing of tax revenues between the central and the state governments to make health an item in the concurrent list of the constitution. So the concurrent list means that uh, the state government as well as the central government are uh, responsible for the provision of health, in which case I think regulation of healthcare provision across the country, the attraction of investment into healthcare, I think most of health expenditures by these state governments are of a current character. They are not necessarily infrastructure enhancing or capital expenditures. So those things can take place and those things will bode well for the medium term. You've taken us straight to money, so let's talk money. But first of all, I want to ask Bali about the background to this because there is, Rugbender, you were saying no replacement really for having a public health system. But in fact, in India, as you've been, made it very clear, Bali, it is primarily uh, private in terms of the provision of the infrastructure and the services. There is a history to that and a reason for that, isn't there? That's true. So I think the the quick and dirty explanation for that is that it is policy neglect. So I think successive governments uh, in the immediate years after independence neglected social policy by and large and focused more on industrial development and economic planning. And many social policy sectors, including healthcare, were largely neglected. And India's first few health policy documents offer this overarching vision of a publicly financed and provided healthcare system, sort of modeled along the British uh, national health system. But that policy ambition was was never realized or was never committed to. And in the 1990s, India embarked on a series of structural reforms where the government cut back its budgetary spending in many areas, largely to sort of put itself back on a pathway of fiscal sustainability. And one of the key areas where they cut back was on spending in social policy, including in education and in healthcare. And this allowed the private sector to step in to meet that gap. 
I was just wondering, though, from a political imperative point of view, and, and we're speaking in a country like Australia, I mean, I know we're a developed country, but we spend all oh, 10, even more percent of GDP on healthcare. India spends less than 2% of GDP on healthcare. Is there no political imperative for it to be a bigger national priority? Public spending is less than 2% of GDP, but total spending is about 5% of GDP. And that number isn't that different from other low middle income countries. If you can look at Southeast Asia, for example, we have similar health outcomes. They spend about the same amount of money. So if you look at Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, all of those spendings are around 4 to 6% of GDP. But the share of the public sector is much larger, and that has been a recent uh, development. So I think India's health financing story is not unusual in that respect. It mirrors the reform story across most of the developing world that healthcare is largely financed privately, uh, and the state over the past 10 to 15 years has started to spend more money on healthcare. But that balance to make significant inroads into reducing the share of private spending is challenging for several reasons. Well, when you say challenging, what do you see as the the biggest challenge? So the biggest challenge over here is, you know, I, I don't like quoting President Trump, but in 2017, he made this flippant remark once that nobody knew healthcare could be so complicated. It's incredibly complex, especially financing healthcare. You know, it's like shaping a balloon, you you solve one aspect of the health financing problem and it presents itself in another area of the health system. What these countries have in common, and particularly India, is that the dominant private sector has become so large and pervasive that it gives rise to questions of entrenched interests that sort of stymie any reform. We have many examples where even though hospitals and Doctors and doctors groups compete for patients individually. They collude among each other when their interests are undermined. So whenever in any of these healthcare programs where the government tries to step in, either to moderate pricing, for instance, or to encourage them to be more responsive to patients' needs, those efforts are resisted by private hospitals and by a very dominant private sector. And that's challenging because the government doesn't have many instruments to control them or shape their behavior or incentivize them um, to act differently. The fact that it spends so little denies them this leverage to intervene in the health system. And this is, again, a story that's common across most health systems where the private sector is dominant. Examples even in South Korea, for instance, a high-income developed country, which mostly relies on the private sector in the delivery of health services, the government struggles to intervene and shape uh, the behavior of healthcare providers, most of whom are in the private sector. With your permission, I'd, I'd like to add a few things to what uh, Bali has just said. I stand by my statement that uh, though insurance is the, is the dominant area of policy right now, there really is no substitute for publicly provided good health care in India in the medium term. It has to be done. And there is an added impetus to that because the 2019 reforms, which Bali was mentioning, actually uh, gave the government a lot of political uh, ammunition and people responded to that uh, those reforms pretty pretty well and then after 2019 when the um, corona epidemic came on the, the government was faced with a tremendous challenge and it realized that they had to spend more on healthcare that healthcare had to be better organized and of course not just the government but the people also came to realize that the country needed to have better healthcare so healthcare is now a public provision of healthcare. And of course, the corona vaccine was produced privately in India, but it was distributed to the government. And in fact, if you recall, the provision of the vaccine was chaotic so long as the state governments were responsible for it and improved remarkably when the central government took over. So the public provision of healthcare is now politically important. And see, all this while, what was happening was that um, the inability to do tax reform, to raise more revenues, and to inability to reform the public health system in India uh, was an excuse for privatization. Uh, but now things have changed. And uh, I think that in the next few years, especially after the next election, after the 24 elections, uh, healthcare expenditures will take a very prominent place in the Indian policy agenda.
Bali, do you do you share that optimism that the the money will be found and the commitment will be made? I agree that there's been increasing recognition of the importance of healthcare in India. And I think for the first time, uh, it's a concern among elites as well, because what happened during the pandemic was that the lack of coverage was also experienced by the rich and the ultra rich that struggled to access parts of the health system during the pandemic. So I think there is recognition across society that there needs to be a stronger coordination among actors in the healthcare system, particularly a strong publicly provided healthcare system. But the extent to which successive governments deliver on this vision is something that we will see in, in the coming years after the 2024 elections. But I agree that there is increasing issue salience, particularly among political parties at the subnational level, that we need to deliver a stronger publicly provided healthcare system. In terms of whether Ayushman Bharat or PMJ is an appropriate instrument, I agree with Professor Jhar on that, that there's nothing much else that the government could do at this stage because the total resources that are required to strengthen public hospitals and to strengthen its existing healthcare system are, are very meager. So India spends about 1.4% of GDP on healthcare and even though over the past 15 years there have been policy promises to increase this to 2.5%, 3%, there have been very few concrete proposals or committed efforts to do so. So what the PMJ does is offer expansion of uh, public spending incrementally. So I expect over the next 10 to 15 years, the current healthcare program, which covers about 500 million people, will be gradually extended as well as the benefits that the program offers will also be gradually increased. So, for example, it covers only hospital care right now. And I imagine over the next five years, it will also extend to other aspects of care, such as diagnostic care, you know, outpatient care or primary care, for instance. There's also, Bali, though, just the mere fact that you have a system that is basically leaving at least 40% of the Indian population completely not covered. No, I agree with that. So, But I genuinely think that if I reflect on health policy reforms towards universal coverage, um, healthcare reforms that have focused on achieving universal coverage, I can't think of any example across the developing world where a health system where the private sector is dominant, that the government has been able to achieve universal health coverage just by increasing the amount of money it's spending. You know, I think the closest example is China, where in 2005, the government introduced reforms to expand um, healthcare coverage, and it's taken about 15 years to do so. So that, that's the first response, where I don't think it's an easy policy task to do, where if you have a health system that's privately organized and financed, that the government can step in and just spend its way to universal coverage. The government doesn't trust the private sector, um, and the private sector has a very poor track record on meeting the needs of particularly vulnerable sections of society. So I agree with Professor Jha that one of the real policy priorities is to ensure that healthcare costs remain affordable because invariably what has happened in the past is when the government goes to the private sector and says, we want you to deliver healthcare for a section of society and submit us those bills and we will pay you for those. That has escalated costs dramatically. Um, we've got reform experiences in Vietnam, for example, in the United States, where um, the governments have, have burnt its fiscal coffers relying on the private sector in the delivery of health services. So what is unusual about PMJ is that the government has negotiated with hospitals and used its purchasing power to lock in very attractive rates, fixed cost rates per episode of illness. And that is a very attractive proposition for, for patients and beneficiaries of the program because now they know that they don't have to pay anything out of pocket. It's not that attractive a proposition for hospitals because they don't like their wings clipped and particularly private hospitals who are very attentive towards their bottom line, but they're attracted by the sheer of scale that they have access now to a market of around 500 million people, which may offset some of these price conditions. Can I just add something to that? I agree that it is difficult for the government to spend its way towards a universal health care. But then you have to take uh, other factors into account, other policy measures, along with increasing uh, expenditure. Increasing expenditure, I think the consensus can be built up in the next parliament, given what has happened in Corona. 
but uh, what is also needed is regulatory change. The regulatory change meaning, for instance, putting healthcare in the concurrent list so that the central government can also invest in, in healthcare on a sustained basis and then make it attractive. For example, if you look at how uh, insurance was treated in India, the insurance sector, it, it had a very hard problem. It was always in the public sector. It was the reverse of the healthcare. It's an interesting example to contrast insurance and healthcare in India because it was handled only by the public sector. And then it has been liberalized so much that it's a very robust system with a lot of private sector investment in it. And the system is working reasonably well, given India's bureaucratic structure. So a similar thing can happen in the case of healthcare if you, if you make it attractive. And this was because the government made it attractive for uh, private investment to come into insurance. And that included foreign investors. So something like that can come into healthcare in India. Uh, provided the right policy mix is put in place. So that, along with a greater public expenditure on healthcare, can move us gradually, I'm not saying this will happen overnight, towards a system of publicly provided health for most, if not all, Indians. So I agree in some respects. So, you know, we need greater regulation in, in India's health system and regulatory reform. And a key part of that is also resourcing these regulatory agencies that sort of govern PMJ. So I'll give you a quick example. I know the United States is an unfair comparison because of the vast differences in levels of economic development. But Medicare, for example, which covers 40 million beneficiaries in the United States, has a staff of 6,000 personnel trained in health administration. Uh, the corresponding numbers for one of the programs prior to PMJ, the RSBY, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which has a population of 200 million, is about 42. And the state of Bihar, which has a population of about 100 million, is 10. So the amount of resourcing, the amount of personnel in charge of these regulatory agencies that govern these programs, we definitely need additional resourcing. I realize the United States is an unfair comparison, but at least it offers a benchmark for us. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you you can find it at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by economist Emeritus Professor Raghbendra Jha and South Asia public policy expert Associate Professor Azad Bali. We're talking about the complex tapestry of India's healthcare systems. And we've talked a, a bit about what needs to happen and uh, and certainly just before um, our break just then, Bali, you gave us a sense of some of the resourcing issues, but can we just draw a, a better picture for people not familiar with the system about some of the challenges faced in a country like India? Bali, when it comes to health risks, COVID's obviously been uh, the very big one in recent years, but what are some of the other big challenges? So in terms of the broad spectrum of challenges um, in India, again, so I echo some of Professor Jha's comments that India has come a long way in addressing many of its health policy challenges, but there are many that it struggles with and continue to loom around the horizon. So in terms of prevalent diseases, India has a twin challenge of addressing infectious and communicable diseases, as well as some of the non-communicable diseases such as hypertension and other cardiovascular illnesses. It has been extremely successful in eradicating pulse polio, the polio virus. It's largely brought the HIV AIDS epidemic under control and doing a reasonable job in managing the burden of tuberculosis. But over the past five or six years, we've seen a rise in drug resistance tuberculosis in many parts of South Asia. Um, dengue and chikungunya have also been a continuous source of worry for urban planners. And that's something that's the government is paying attention to. Another broad spectrum of 
public health risks uh, stem from antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial resistance is essentially when pathogens and bacteria become resistant to medicine and thereby reducing the efficacy of known interventions to treat illnesses. So essentially treating the same bacteria requires more and more powerful antibiotics or antibiotics for a longer period of time. And that's a significant global risk. And many countries in Asia and in the developing world, particularly India and Indonesia, are identified as global hotbeds of antimicrobial resistance. That is something that is concerning the government and that is a considerable priority for India's public health system. The other broad healthcare risks that are around the horizon, India still has a relatively young population, but it's also aging quickly. So over the next 10 years, the share of people above the age of 60, for example, is going to increase by 40%. So with increasing aging, it's associated with higher healthcare costs, and we need additional resources to be able to pay for those healthcare costs. You know, Professor Jha talked about the risks of around financing healthcare, which successive governments and policy reforms have largely ignored. So the fact that 60% of individuals in India still have to pay for healthcare through out-of-pocket payments is a significant source of risk because it can push people into poverty and including selling assets to pay for healthcare costs. So the spectrum of public health challenges that exist, but there's also the question of risks that exist if India doesn't make significant inroads into addressing some of the ways it's financing healthcare. But I don't want to paint an overly bleak picture. The Ayushman Bharat reform is an effort in the right direction and when layered with conducive political conditions, is likely going to increase resourcing into healthcare. And there have been, you know, reforms over the past six or seven years to address some of these drivers of public health diseases and infectious diseases, such as the Swachh Bharat campaign or the Clean India campaign, uh, building toilets, um, efforts to make inroads into ending open defecation, for instance. So all of these have been some strides to help manage some of these public health risks. One of the things that, Rugbenja, that you mentioned earlier, the the fact that delivery is largely left to the states, and we do have a really uh, quite a lot of disparity, don't we, in the provision of services uh, and the outcomes across the states in India. Can you give us a sense of some of those disparities and some of the reasons behind them? Yeah, well, you know, this, this doesn't necessarily correlate with economic performance, Apparently, the the best performing state in terms of longevity and some other healthcare outcomes is Kerala, but it is not a particularly prosperous state. One of the worst performers is Madhya Pradesh. It's not a very prosperous state, nor is it uh, the least prosperous state in the country. So what's driving those outcomes, do you think? What is driving those outcomes is budgetary choices, because money is given to the states and how they spend it on health and so on. And because health uh, did not have so much of a priority in in the minds of politicians or the people, it got neglected. uh, And uh, what took its place was basically current subsidies. So a lot of state money is spent on current subsidies for current consumption, which is a very wasteful way of spending uh, taxpayers' money. One more thing I wanted to add uh, in the context of uh, the provision of healthcare in India is that India has an excellent program of pharmaceutical provision, which we have not talked about so far. Subsidized uh, pharmaceuticals are available in a number of outlets all over the country. So people may have some problems uh, of the kind that Bali and I have been talking about in being taken care of by doctors or hospitals. But their medicine costs are kept quite low. So this is another major recent area of reform in health provision in India, which we should take note. Uh, Most recently, the the pandemic, the corona, the COVID pandemic in India, where it not only provided more than 2 billion vaccines for its own citizens, but also managed to export vaccines to so many other countries. So there have been some very substantial elements of um, progress in India's journey in the healthcare sector. Nothing is perfect, of course, and uh, there's nothing here that cannot be cured with good, sensible policy.
Bali, can I ask you about that disparity between the states? Do you see it, as uh, Rugbenja does, as choice about where to invest? That there, Because there is a huge disparity. I mean, Kerala, which uh, Rugbenja brought up, Kerala has a life expectancy at birth that is 12 years more than Madhya Pradesh. So what, what, what do you put that down to? So I agree to some extent that it's got to do with resourcing, uh, but there are other issues as, as well that could be at play. Um, so that there's very stark disparities. So, for example, in the maternal mortality ratio, the most recent survey in India suggests that Kerala has a maternal mortality ratio of about 46. It's the lowest in India. And the highest is in the state of Assam, which is 237. And if you, if you look at under five mortality, for instance, the southern states of Kerala, Tamil Nadu and, and Maharashtra have about half the levels of some of the other provinces uh, in the north. So there are these wide variations across states and there are also wide variations within states because these states are very large. You know, Uttar Pradesh, 200 million plus people, it gives rise to a lot of variation in the population distribution. So one of the reasons could be possibly money. The another possible explanation is deeply conflated with other covariates of economic development, such as education, uh, for instance, female labor force participation, so that there are other variables at place. And the third is that many of these governments, particularly Tamil Nadu and Kerala, have taken their public health priorities a bit more seriously. So if we remember that healthcare in India is largely a state subject, uh, as early in the 1990s, the chief minister of Tamil Nadu at that point, Jalalitha, had introduced reforms particularly focused on addressing maternal mortality and reducing infant mortality. One of those flagship reform initiatives was that she expected a report on her table of every infant that had passed away during delivery and an explanation from that hospital superintendent why that had occurred. So the fact that there was such political oversight by the chief minister sent a message all the way through to be more careful and spread awareness and educational campaigns on neonatal and prenatal health care. So these are just some examples. There's a recent book written by a former health secretary in India who just talks about the role of street level bureaucrats or entrepreneurs who's spent, what, 20 years in the subnational health quarters in Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka who have, you know, been able to be slightly entrepreneurial and, and innovative in learning on the job and institutionalizing some of those lessons. So I agree with the larger story that some of it's got to do with money, but another part of it's got to do with perhaps the level of political commitment and resolution amongst actors in, in the subnational level that have played a role. That actually, uh, Bali, because we're almost out of time, does bring me to my final sort of question, because you've both expressed a great deal of optimism about, you know, how far the system has already come in India and about where it might go. But fundamentally, that is going to require enormous political will um, at both the, the national level and at the state level. Do you both, and maybe maybe Bhagbendra, if I can go to you first, do you believe that that will is there and indeed even... Uh, the political imperative is there, that post-COVID people uh, are demanding more. Well, they're certainly responding to such incentives, as is evident in uh, the 2019 elections and in the number of state-level elections. The political will is definitely there. And uh, I think that uh, the model for, for central intervention in the state's health subject has already been devised or at least been initiated through the PMJ scheme, as Bali was saying, that the central government gives a, a lot of money to the state governments to run the PMJ scheme, and then the state governments are happy to accept that money. So over time, I think that once this effort becomes more and more sustained and more and more entrenched, the state governments would be willing to accept more handouts and more support from the central government, as well as institutional change. The decision to move healthcare from the state subject to the concurrent area will require a constitutional change. And uh, I don't think there will be any problem in, in getting this constitutional change through. A number of constitutional changes have occurred, in most recently uh, with the GST. There is no state government involvement in that because the constitutional amendment occurs only through the central parliament and the state governments have no role in it.
Bali, your, your thoughts on political will and, and political imperative? So I agree. I think there is this increasing recognition of the importance of social policy and social policy being an instrument to gain political legitimacy. And I think the current government has been extremely astute in realizing that and using that very astutely in advancing their policy priorities. So you've seen a, a spectrum of policies introduced that have to do with housing, electrification, increasing resourcing that's flowing into rural households. So I think the healthcare is on the policy agenda. I agree that there is increasing recognition that in the coming years, there's increasing political appetite to spend more on healthcare. And I think for the first time, um, health policy is central to all political campaigns and on the first page of most election manifestos. My caution in this is that the private sector in India is extremely dominant. And in the past, they have not been a trusting ally of the government in delivering universal health coverage. Whenever the government has knocked on their doors, it has had some success, but it's come at a great cost in terms of it being too expensive or it not providing care for vulnerable sections of society. But PMJ, to that extent, is slightly cautious in some respects because it it covers about 40% of the population. And this period where, where the government is rolling it out offers an avenue for them to sort of get the design correct, calibrate the design to ensure that it is sustainable to be scaled up to the entire population. So I'm largely optimistic about the reform and its potential to achieve and realize universal coverage in India. Certainly. I I think (laughs) there is a very long road ahead, even if it's been a long road travelled already. So no doubt this is a topic that we will return to on Ear to Asia. An enormous thank you, both of you, to Bali and to Vagbenja for your insights uh, on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Our guests have been Associate Professor Azad Bali from the University of Melbourne and Emeritus Professor Ragbendra Jha from the Australian National University. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. Please rate and review us. It helps new listeners find the show and put a good word in for us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 25th of May, 2023. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.